a song a couple of years ago, and I'm not sure you remember it, but uh, Peggy and I are going to sing through the first verse, and then we want you to stand and join us. We'll sing the first verse a second time, and then the second and the third verse as well. But it's a, it's a great song that the Gettys have composed, and uh, it just speaks of a heart that is filled with, with thankfulness for the Lord's uh, goodness. And so let us uh, give it a try, and then you can join us, all right? My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. Crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me with his light and wrote his love of righteousness with power upon my heart. Okay, you know it now perfectly, don't you? <laughs> All right, let's sing that first verse again and then we'll sing verse two and three. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again, who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me with his life. And wrote his love of righteousness with power upon my heart. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who walks beside, who floods my weaknesses with strength and causes fears to fly. Every promise is enough for every step I take, sustaining me with arms of love and crowning me with grace. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who reigns above. Well, we're glad that you're here this morning, and it's not usual, usually our custom, but we're thinking perhaps we should have confession at the end of our service for all that we ate last week. Oh, my, my. Did you ever hear it said, or, or maybe, maybe even the thought entered your own mind, that I would be more thankful if I was just happier about my circumstances in life? I would be more thankful if I was just happier, a little bit happier about my circumstances in life. True or false? You've, you've heard that? You've maybe said that, thought that? Yeah. You know, many have found a life principle to be counterintuitive, but it's one that is entirely true. And, and here's what it is. In most cases, it isn't happy people who are thankful. Instead, it is thankful people who are happy. I'm going to say it again. In, in many cases, it isn't happy people who are thankful. Instead, it's thankful people who are happy. I put some pictures uh, 
of, of friends of ours uh, on the screen. And in, in the case of each individual, each couple, uh, our ministry at Mayfair was blessed by God to see them come to Christ. The one exception, of course, is Jim Hawk, and he was our neighbor up here at the cottage. You see Jim down at the bottom. And you know, another interesting thing is that one, two, three, three of the folk that are pictured here are with the Lord today. The lady on the far left just died of cancer. Jim died uh, just before her, Jim Hawk down at the bottom. And Greg uh, up in the upper, was it right hand? Uh, upper left hand corner. Greg uh, had a heart attack and ran his car into a tree and died. His wife has been here to visit us several times, Janine. But let me tell you, these people found joy, the joy of the Lord, when they came to know Jesus as their Savior. And we were so thankful to have a part in that, that process of helping them come to know him. Well, you know, while this, uh, this principle I mentioned has the support of Scripture, it's backed up, it's actually backed up by research done by psychologists from the University of California, University of Miami, and the University of Pennsylvania. And I'll say I'm very impressed by that. Yeah, their findings have been compiled and published by the staff at Harvard Medical School in an article, article that's entitled, Giving Thanks Can Make You happier. Giving thanks can make you happier. Isn't it amazing the way the scientific community slowly, reluctantly, but eventually comes around to agree with God? What do you know? And this is because as Gabeline has written, all truth so far as it is, is true is God's truth. Here's what these noted psychologists have written about gratitude or thankfulness. Gratitude is a thankful appreciation for what an individual receives, whether tangible or intangible. With gratitude, people acknowledge the goodness in their lives. In the process, they usually recognize that the source of that goodness lies at least partially outside of themselves. Well, that's an interesting idea. As a result, being grateful also helps people connect to something larger than themselves as individuals, whether to other people, nature, or a higher power. Huh? Light bulb. Every good and every perfect gift comes from where? From above. In positive psychology research, gratitude is strongly and consistently associated with greater happiness. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve their health, deal with adversity, and build strong relationships. So there you have it. It isn't just Pastor Dean in the Bible that says so. Members of the scientific community agree. It isn't happy people who are thankful. It is thankful people who are happy. Let's dive into this a little bit. First, we should admit that happiness what happiness is and what happiness isn't. Happiness is a feeling triggered by positive, uplifting, or pleasant circumstances. Wr write this down somewhere in your memory. Happiness is a feeling, okay? It is a feeling. It is an emotional response to happenings. Happenings. In fact, the word happiness has haps, which is short for happenings, baked right into it. But the trouble is this, the circumstances and the people in our lives are not always positive. They are not always pleasant in themselves. And by the way, this is a good moment not to look around, not to make eye contact with anybody particular, but to look straight ahead, you know. We all have troubles and disappointments. We all suffer setbacks and injuries that leave a mark. People let us down. People wound us, and quite honestly, the stuff of real life doesn't always trigger happiness. And it's, it's hard to say we're thankful for some of it. You know, like the tide, like the stock market, like the temperature in Michigan, <laughs> happiness tends to rise and fall, to rise and fall. We feel happy when good things happen, and nothing is bothering us, yet feelings of happiness can be snatched away in a moment. 
a troubling phone call, the screech of tires, a disappointing diagnosis, a hurtful comment. You know, all of these can take happiness away in a heartbeat. We know this is true. It's hard to be happy when we're not feeling it. And so happiness is temporary and it's transitory. I mean, am I right about that? None of us are happy, happy all the time. But a spirit of thankfulness or gratefulness isn't like that. Thankfulness doesn't rise and fall because it isn't triggered by pleasant or uplifting circumstances or people. It doesn't rise or fall on things that can change in a heartbeat. And just like our faith, thankfulness is a settled disposition that owns its source and basis to realities that are rock solid, permanent, and unchanging. And so because it is true, with confidence, we can say it isn't happy people who are thankful. Instead, it's thankful people who are happy. But let's dive in a little deeper. For one thing, nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to be happy. Uh-oh. Nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to be happy. Holy? Yes. Joyful? Yes. But happy? No. Yet the command to be thankful is repeated numerous times in both Testaments. This morning we went through 16 different passages that urge us to be thankful people and, and tell us why it's reasonable for us to be happy people. In Psalm 95, verse 2 and 3, it says, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us joyfully shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. That's a command. Colossians 3.15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And then, too, throughout the Bible, happiness or gladness of heart is presented as a result, an outcome, not something to be pursued in and of itself. For example, the first psalm begins this way, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Blessed or happy is the man. Here in the first psalm, Blessedness, which includes happiness and well-being, is not something to be pursued. Instead, it's the consequence of faith and actions that are aligned with God and his truth. Other examples where happiness is a byproduct are the Beatitudes. And, and each of the eight Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 begin with a promise of blessing. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Now the word blessed is makarios in the Greek language, and it means happy, blissful, or literally to be enlarged. My brother wrote a post about his, his wife, it was her birthday, and he said, Michelle, I love you so much I could burst. Well, he got points for that, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, that went viral. And uh, he, he got points for that. But this is, this is the idea. It's, it's being, you know, so, so enlarged by, by blessing that we could burst. Once again, happiness is never commanded, nor are we urged to pursue happiness in and of itself. Instead, happiness is a byproduct. Happiness is the result of a formula or a recipe followed. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart. And just like a cake, you know, that doesn't turn out the way you hoped, happiness depends on what's baked in. And that's what Jesus is telling us. If you don't follow the recipe, if you don't add the right ingredients, the end product will not be what you hoped for. And so in the very same way, many people are unhappy because they haven't found that, that God is the true source of blessing. And it's his word that guides us to the life that brings us the greatest satisfaction. So the point I'm making is this. In the Bible, we're not commanded to be happy. Instead, happiness is the state of blessedness, which is the result or consequence of being rightly related to God. Moments of happiness are experienced by everybody. But, but things 
that tend to make us happy are elusive and they're, they're short-lived. And the fact remains, it's entirely possible to experience happiness without being thankful. I mean, think of the lepers that Jesus healed. He healed 10 of them. Only one of the 10 came back to thank him. Were they happy? Oh, you bet they were happy. They had a miracle occur in their lives. Once they were outcasts and immediately when Jesus spoke the word, they were made clean and whole. Boy, did they have something to be happy about. But only one, only one came back to thank Jesus. So once again, unlike happiness, God's people are commanded, commanded to be thankful. Psalm 100, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Come to church with thanksgiving and praise in your heart. Get tuned up before you ever walk through the door. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Notice that. Joyful shouts, gladness, singing, praise, and thanksgiving are all appropriate for all you lands. You know what that means? People everywhere. People at all times, in every place. Why? Because the Lord is good and because his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. And then verse 4 commands us to be thankful to him and to bless his name. And so a spirit of thankfulness sets believers apart from those that don't acknowledge God, from those who don't give God his rightful place in their lives. And unlike happiness, which rises and falls, thankfulness is stable and it's constant because it's based on realities that are solid and unchangeable. See, thankfulness is rooted in these facts we know to be true about God. I heard the story uh, about an atheist who paused when the light at a crossroads turned green. And this fellow paused just long enough when from out of sight, a tractor trailer ran the red light and barreled through that intersection. Well, the man breathed a sigh of relief. He was was a lucky guy. He was a lucky guy. Had he pulled out, he would have been broadsided by that tractor trailer. But for some reason, he paused. And mixed in with the gladness that he felt at that moment, he felt this strong urge to thank somebody. But he's an atheist. Who would he thank? Was the urge to pause just a stroke of luck? Well, somehow he felt it was more than that. But who or or what caused him to pause? And as a card-carrying atheist, he didn't know. And like that driver... Apart from the knowledge of God, the unbelieving world experiences many feelings of happiness. They may even feel the urge to express thanksgiving, but the unbeliever is at a loss to know who to thank, who to thank. The Bible is very clear when it says we're to be thankful to the Lord. Like Tim Tebow and others, professional athletes who bend their knee to thank God for a victory or or for blessings they enjoy are seen as weirdos. <laughs> you know, in the climate of today, they're extremists. And in the first chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul describes the downward spiral of a world that has rejected God and removed him from their thinking. And the moral degradation that follows in this passage precisely describes the, the, the condition of our nation. In verse 21, Paul wrote, because although they knew God, that is from the beginning of the time when, when God was known, they did not glorify him as God. They started making idols and bowing down to dumb things like sticks and rocks. Nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
And so we see when our creator isn't glorified, in other words, when God isn't acknowledged for the greatness of who he is, people become increasingly unthankful. <coughs> and so futile or empty ideas and theories replace thoughts that are sensible and true. And when the light of truth about God is rejected or extinguished, darkness quickly fills that void. And so Paul says hearts are darkened. They're darkened. You know, there's a correlation, there's a clear link between acknowledging the greatness of God and his goodness and those who possess a spirit of thankfulness. I, I've often said this. The more you know God, the more you will love him. The more you know Jesus, the more you will love him. And so it's coming to know God that causes our thankfulness to increase. And we, we get to know him through his word. Now, unlike the atheist driver who didn't know who to thank, we joyfully sing, listen, praise God from whom all blessings flow. What a beautiful doctrinal statement that is. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And so the invitation and the reasonable command of scripture is for us to be thankful to God for everything. Psalm 95, 2 let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. You see, proceeding from our knowledge of who God is and all that he has done for us, we, what we do is we gather in his presence to express our thankfulness. And in this, this spirit, we shout joyfully to him. Well, okay, we don't worship the same way the Jewish believers did. If somebody were to shout joyfully... We might hear those with card-carrying licenses pull something out of a holster, you know? We'd be threatened. But the Jews, apparently their worship was exuberant. Exuberant. We don't see our lives at the hand of fate or luck or karma. We don't attribute our fortunes to some nameless force. Instead, we see our lives in the hand of a God who is gracious and loving, merciful, forgiving, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise. And listen, he's personal. He's personal. And so unlike the unbeliever, we know who God is and, and why he deserves to be thanked. We've tasted his goodness. We know him as our heavenly father. We know that we have been blessed beyond measure and from whom those blessings have come. Psalm 69, 30, David wrote, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Now the name of God embraces all that is true about God. It encompasses all of his great and unchanging attributes. And though circumstances and people around us change and feelings of happiness come and go, God is ever the same. He's immutable. He's unchangeable. An appropriate way to praise him, the psalm says, is through songs, like the songs that we're singing this morning. To magnify him with thanksgiving is to add substance to his glory. Substance which causes others to recognize how great our God is. And described here is the impact of going public with testimonies of what God has done for us. And that's what we want to do in just a couple of minutes. I encouraged you through an email to come prepared to share just a word of testimony. It doesn't have to be a big, long sermon. In fact, we're hoping it isn't. Uh, but but just, just something that you are thankful to the Lord for. And like the ripple effect of a stone thrown into the center of a pond, Paul had this spreading effect of thanksgiving in mind in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. And there he wrote, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. You know, those we, we come in contact with and rub elbows with may be glad to hear that something has made us happy. But an even greater, an even deeper impression is made by thankfulness that is, listen, regular 
regular and not based on the many some things that happen in our lives, whether good or bad. It's our lifestyle. We praise God even when the creek dries up, even when the economy tanks. Bob Anderson was the most thankful person I have ever met. To know Bob was to love him. He was by no means a handy guy. He was the very opposite of a handy guy. Yet in his 80s, Bob would always show up for church work days. And finding something that Bob could do was, was a real challenge sometimes, you know. But I can't count the number of times he thanked me. Bob would say, Pastor, thank you for, for letting me come today. Thank you for putting up with me. I am as dumb and useless as they come, but I'm thankful I can do something for the Lord. So thank you, Pastor. He said it so often to me and to others, we almost wanted to say, cool it, Bob, we get the point. You know? But how could we say that when we knew that this was something that came from his heart? We knew his thankfulness wasn't something put on. It wasn't exaggerated. Thankfulness was woven into the fabric of his life. This was authentic Bob Anderson. You know, I heard this thankfulness again when I visited Bob in the emergency room. Bob had fallen down his basement stairs backwards. And he hit his head, the back of his head, on the sharp edge of the poured foundation. Paramedics found him unconscious and bleeding profusely. The wound he sustained was, was just awful. It was, it was like being scalped from back to front. The flesh on his head was peeled back. He suffered a severe concussion. But I want you to know this. As soon as he regained consciousness, as soon as he could speak, Bob told me he was thankful I was there. He was thankful that God had spared his life. He was thankful for the good care he was receiving at the hospital. And he was thankful his wife, June, wasn't left without a husband to care for her. That's all we could get him to say was, I'm thankful. You see, Bob knew from whom all blessings flow and in whose hands his life was kept. And even in circumstances that trigger anything but happiness, Bob thanked the Lord. So let me wrap this up. For believers, thanksgiving is a word that embodies the highest act of gratitude for the greatest gift received from God, the gift of salvation by the grace of God made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, I, I've said this often, but if you have trusted Jesus to save you, you are richer than the one who wins the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. You are richer by far. That ought to light your fire, right? That ought to light your fire. That's what we're saying here. Through faith in Jesus, we have come to know God as he is. Jesus shows us who God is and proves how much we're loved by him. And through him, we have been blessed with promises for today and hope for tomorrow. And by him, our lives are made secure by his presence with us and in us. Even in the somethings of life, we're never alone. He's always there. You know, the, the final hymn of all time, uh, a hymn that is soon to be sung without end, is praise and honor to God with overwhelming thankfulness. Revelation 7:12, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. And so here's a Thanksgiving challenge for every one of us. Let's practice this song of eternity. You know, it is amazing to see what doors of grace and blessing are open to those whose hearts are thankful. And so if you want to be happier, practice the grace of thankfulness. I mean, even the Harvard School of Medicine agrees. 
<laughs> it isn't happy people who are thankful, but thankful people who are happy. They say thankfulness will help us feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve our health, deal with adversity, and build strong relationships. That's their conclusion. So here's my advice to you. If you want to get your happy on, <laughs> count your blessings and be thankful. Start and end each day with thankfulness for all you have in Christ. And, and with the hours in between, the start and end of the day, do the same thing. Do the same thing. And when somebody asks, how are you? You know, what do we say? Fine, fine, I'm fine. Like a bobblehead, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine, fine. Try something different. Try saying, I'm thankful. Train yourself to just say, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. Because in fact, we ought to be, right? Yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the many blessings we have in Christ. We're thankful just for the great privilege of knowing who you are, knowing that we live in a world when so many people are, are blind to the truth about you. We know you. And this knowledge has made us rich. We are wealthy because we know you. And you know us, and we are your children. And someday, we're going to live together in your presence forever. We give you thanks for all of this, for we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.